So I thought I'd talk to you a bit more today about the linings and I realised as I was thinking about what would be useful to tell you that really it crosses over as well into corner blocks and a little into instrument construction. Um, as you can see I've got a cello here today, all the things I'm saying in all these videos are applicable across violin, viola, cello, double bass or whatever you're playing. Um, so to start with the linings. The linings are really to reinforce the strength of the ribs, but it also gives a larger gluing platform for the front and back plate. Otherwise, it, on a cello, these ribs are about one and a half millimetres, so there's really not that much that would connect it to the plates, which would just end up in lots of problems of gluing, cracks, or well, whatever you can think of, really. There's a few main ways to mortise them in. Generally at the corner blocks and the end blocks they're joined so in this case it depends what kind of block construction you have. There's a kind of traditional, well there's two traditional ways. One would be with the block square diagonally in and the other would be kind of square across the surface and these just create slightly different alignments of the block that you can play with how you join the linings in. It will either be joined in a mortise, like a square end mortise, or if you have it on a diagonal, which in this case it is, it's, you can have a diagonal join that just touches against the block but still protects it moving out. So those are the two main uses. And in terms of repair, linings are one of the the biggest pains, if you ever have a lining that comes loose, and this is the reason for putting them in the mortises in the first place, you have to take the whole instrument apart for what might be a very, very small loose part just on the middle somewhere. And I've got my inspection mirror at the moment, but as it's always on the underneath, underneath side, you can only ever really check it with the inspection mirror very well, especially when you've already got one, either the front or the back on. So in terms of determining it, it's almost impossible to see. If you've got an old instrument open, it's generally covered in so much dirt on the inside that most of the line, just, just under the rim here, will kind of look black anyway. So you really have to kind of go over with a fine tooth comb if you ever want to find that it's loose and buzzing. And the cost of the job is so disproportionate to the amount of re-gluing it takes for the lining. It's just a very overall large job for something that should be very small but it's just kind of one of the one of the flaws of um, both string instruments really so and so i want to say I'll talk about the blocks which i think i've told you most of the things that we use for oh, in fact there's also on old instruments when you look inside an instrument you can generally see if it has corner blocks cellos generally will always have corner blocks or some version of corner block scene. On violas and violins, you can get away with um, just having the ribs go together at the end and not having as much reinforcement, especially for all the German made instruments. And they did this on cellos as well. As you can see here, I've got, um, if you just see the, the mould on the inside, would be um, it's an inside mould. That's the kind of traditional Cremonese method. The Brescian method, would be you'd build the back first and then you'd build the ribs on top of the back shape and then you can either do it with linings or without linings depending on the thickness of the ribs and the when it came to like the German factories so we're talking the kind of industrial revolution times the French factories didn't do this specifically but it was around that same period kind of early 1900s maybe late 1800s they used to use an outside mould instead which is actually still today used more similarly for guitars and that's still the common method for making guitars but when you do it on an instrument the corner so the rib joins here they were butted into the outside mould and secured but that would be before the blocks were on as we've got a mould here the order would be you'd make a mould the blocks would be glued on square and rough and then trimmed down to the shape of the instrument and then the ribs would be bent and then glued against them. Whereas with an outside mould, you would bend the ribs first, and then if you wanted, you could put some corner blocks in. But a lot of the time, 
the the kind of German factories didn't bother, and they'd put what essentially is a pseudo um, corner block. So if I can just I'll just tilt this up for you here, I'll just put it down there safely. As you can see, we've got that main kind of line here, which is the end of the block on the inside, and there's a the general curve here, which it's shaped to. And what the Germans would do is if they just they'd take off that section, so there'd be a, basically a hole in there where the ribs would look like would still be to the finished positions, and they'd just put a little front of maybe about three millimeters of spruce in front of it. So when you looked inside the instrument, it would look like the corner blocks are there because they didn't want it to immediately look like a factory instrument and that they'd taken shortcuts. So they used to do that. It does mean that the joints are generally weaker. You'll find a lot of kind of German cellos, especially that the rib joints just at the end have come undone at some point in their life. And they are, are a bit more susceptible to cracks. Um, but the, there's so many instruments that came out of the German factories in those time that it's, it's quite hard to avoid within a certain price range of cello. But yeah, so I think that's everything that I want to tell you about those for the moment. And I hope you enjoyed that, found that useful, and I'll speak to you next time.